Welcome to the Bad Roman Podcast. On this show, we talk with veterans, community leaders, Christians, and non-Christians as we explore the entanglement of Christians with the state. The Bad Roman Project was created out of the firm belief that as Christians, we are called to follow Christ, not the state. Here is your host, Craig Hargis. Hey, folks. As you know, we like to get a variety of perspectives on the show. One thing we have been intentional about is not making this an echo chamber because the individualism aspect is so important to us. That being said, I have the one and only Karen Keener on the show today. Yeah. I'm really excited about this conversation because I've followed Karen for quite some time on Facebook, and she has been pretty outspoken on several different aspects in regards to the state and Christianity. Yeah, let's go. Right. We'd rather serve God than serve right. Caesar, you know me? Right. I'm just trying to live what he said. I'm just trying to live what he said. I ain't scared. I will take one to the head. Go ahead. So it's safe to say that I'm so it's safe to say that I'm bad. So Karen, how are you doing? I am groovy. So before we get into this, why don't you give us a little bit of background of yourself so people if people aren't familiar with you? All right. My background is I grew up um, Christian in a Lutheran church. My mom insisted that I was not baptized Lutheran, but Christian because she didn't see Martin Luther as a baptizing entity, but Christ as we're baptized in Christ. I grew up in Christian schools uh, Bible history classes every single day of my life. And I saw a lot of ego among various kids in Christian schools come from all different churches. They're not necessarily uh, church affiliated with any of the schools. So they were from all different Christian sects and backgrounds. And there was a lot of infighting in, in school. It was like my church, like Baptist is the only way and this is the only way. And so I saw a lot of that as a kid and it was really weird. And I was hoping that one day I would grow up and start a church for smart people <laughs> <laughs> that just kind of looked past a lot of the dogma. <laughs> but I thought, OK, one day I'm going to start a church for people that like think and ask questions and um, aren't like afraid that the devil's going to come down on them if they just think about things and and use some critical thought like, OK, let's just throw a big one right out there. You know, if God is infinite, how is there anything that's opposing God in the universe? Like there would be definite um, real estate disputes <laughs> <laughs> in that situation. <laughs> like, like, how could there be like two powers happening if there's really only one power and one infinite, omniscient, om, omnipresent, omnipotent power that I was taught growing up, but there's something else. And it's like, but where is it if it's not in God, you know, in some way? So those kind of questions, like I thought we should be able to discuss that without being called blasphemer, you know, or whatever. And so when I aged out of school and um, went through a lot of church politics issues and there was like a church breakup. I don't know if any of your listeners have been through one of these, but they are, a, they're a show all of themselves if they have. But when a church splits up and there's like, you know, money and powerful factions involved, it can be really intense and crazy and change your mind about our religion. Um, but for me, I was still a faithful person and I was, invited by a friend to a church of religious science, which is um, new thought um, founded by Ernest Holmes, whose brother was a Protestant minister. And he started talking about the mind in, in relationship to spirituality and Christianity specifically. And then it kind of became its own religion. And like all of these things do, it's kind of like Jesus probably wasn't trying to start a religion. He said, no. <laughs> no, no, thank you. So in those in those regards, I don't think Ernest Holmes meant or intended to start a whole religion. He was trying to teach uh, a way to use your mind in a powerful way through Christian principles. And so I thought this is the church for smart people that I always wanted or envisioned where people talk about things and ask questions and ask how they're involved in the creative process. 
But then, you know, church politics happened there too. And that's where I kind of grew up and realized this happens everywhere. You know, politics gets involved in spirituality and then it's not really spiritual anymore. It's just like, here's our dogma. This is our doctrine. This is what we teach. This is what we believe. So did I just open a whole bunch of cans of worms? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, well, what you said when you were talking about the different uh, denominations, I guess, I just, somebody told me that it hadn't been that long ago. There's 30,000 different denominations. I find something incredibly wrong with that because every one of them think that they're the right one. I spent a lot of my time in Southern Baptist churches. And I and I and I've heard this all the time that the Southern Baptist is the only New Testament church there is, and I agreed with it at the time. And once I got away from all that stuff, I was like, man, this is just garbage. And I, since the COVID stuff started, I haven't been back to church. I really got disappointed with how the church responded to government lockdowns and stuff. And I just have not had any interest. And I had a, a guy at work; he's always inviting me to church. And he said something the other day, and I thought about going. And he said something the other day. He goes, well. Because it's a Baptist church. It was not a Southern Baptist church. The Southern Baptist churches are starting to let the uh, homosexuals into their church. And I'm like, okay, what's wrong with that? Because Jesus said, love your neighbor. Why is this such an issue for people? I don't understand why they, people focus on that so much. And it drives me mad. And I, I just, I just, I, I'm bummed. I'm burnt out on it. And I just can't do it. And that's kind of one thing that started our project too, is because our frustration with Christians, to be honest with you. If it wasn't for my frustration with Christians, we probably wouldn't be talking about this right now. But I've been extremely frustrated with them. It's something that we talk about in my house a lot. And my my husband's family is um, Baptist. I, I went to a Baptist church in California before I left. Some friends of mine invited me to their church. And I can't remember if it was like American Baptist or something. But they were saying they were the only true Christians and from the beginning. And I was like, wait a minute, Baptists? religion started in America? Like, were they all hiding under rocks through like centuries before America came to be in this like religion? I was just like in shock listening to it because I was like, okay, here's here's Jesus and John the Baptist. And, what, and then like, did they have like their own little private secret society like till America happened? Like, how did this work? <laughs> <laughs> like you wonder, right? Is that what they basically teach? I don't know. Like, but I mean, it's the Southern Baptists for the, the, like I said, they would say that they're the only New Testament church, but they feel like they can trace their history back to the early church. I didn't see any of these early church fathers call themselves Baptists. You know what I mean? So, I mean, I've, I've, I've since we started this, I've been fascinated by the early church and learning because I wanted to understand their how they related to the state and. There's no Baptist or Church of Christ or Pentecostal or none of that mentioned in, the, in their writings. It was all about Jesus. And, you know, and they, that was their focus. They, they understood they were Jesus centric and they understood that better than any of us ever will. And I think we need to get back to that. And just follow him. Don't follow a denomination. Because once you start doing that, you're pushing people away. Yeah, yeah. And it, it was just such a weird thing because I was like, there is no real historical evidence of any of this so i'm like it, it would be one thing to say we're trying to get back to the roots of what this church was teaching but to say that they were there all along and they were the first one and they are it and i'm like uh, <laughs> why well and, you know and you said it perfectly you that it gets too political and when it gets like that it's you're losing the message of christ that's what we should be talking about is loving your neighbor and your enemy. I mean, it's difficult to do, but that's all. He, that's what he wants us to do. That was the first thing. He, that's if we focus on that. All that other stuff will just kind of fall in line, I think. Yeah. And, and I think it's probably been this way for a long time. I mean, I grew up with it. There was this whole fear that you were going to burn in hell if you ask any questions. And that was among children, I think, in school that didn't really weren't old enough or mature enough to process nuance. And um, now I see it in adults because of Pizzagate and all these, can I say that? <laughs> <You're fine. laughs> but, but, you know, like there was this whole thing about like how the 
satanic elite Illuminati are pulling the country in one way. And there is this whole like Q phenomenon and everything. Oh my God. That's some crazy stuff in itself. It is. It is. And, but it ends up making that this like really ultra polarized people that won't question Trump because Trump is equated with Jesus in their mind. (laughs) And he's bringing down this satanic. I had a guy tell me that basically, like he was next to next to Christ, like he was second only to Christ. And I'm thinking, dude, are you even hearing yourself? And you're calling yourself a Christian, man. This is gross. And I've really kind of been worried. And this sounds snarky when I say it, but I'm not trying to be a snark. I'm seriously concerned about their mental health. I had a, a girl block me on Facebook because she was going through all this stuff. I said, Are you okay? Are you hearing the stuff that you're posting? I mean, are you, are you thinking this through? Because it doesn't, it sounds insane. She had other people telling her that she, well, if you don't like it, just be unfriend me. I said, I don't want to unfriend you. I just want you to maybe seek some help because this is not right. And I have another guy that follows me around talking about this garbage. And I guess Trump's coming back at some point and taking over. And <laughs> The second coming of Trump. Did you see the one that came out the other day with, that locust or something that landed on Biden and the Q, the Q folks were saying that's a, that's a sign of Trump coming back. I'm like, these people are lunatics, man. I'm sorry if there's any Q supporters listening to it, but I just, you, you guys are crazy. It's the second coming of Trump. They think it's like he, he returns from, from the dead. <laughs> <laughs> they do. They think he's coming back in a couple, couple of months or whatever, but there is this fear that either you're a, some, a girl called me a demon the other. She was like, you must be working with Satan and a demon. And here's, this is another one. I was question, I was, some gal was talking about Mercury retrograde or something like that. And I was like, well, you know, I mean, if God put like everything out there for us to work with us and around us, it doesn't mean that we cannot conquer these challenges, but there may be something to it. Like we know for a fact that the moon affects the tides, it affects women's cycles and women's bodies and stuff like that. And she was like, no, it doesn't because only Jesus runs my body and this, that, and the other. And I said, well, and then you got the sun and circadian rhythm. And when we get out of sync with that, our health suffers. And she was like, "You're Satan's using you to make me think that the, there's power in rocks in the sky. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, with Try living without the sun, you know, like for a little while. I'm telling you <laughs> that God gave us the sun and the moon and all of these things to work with in harmony with. Or, you know, like it does get cold sometimes. You put a jacket on, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like God gave us all the things we need to survive around the things that happen through all of these other and there was just no hearing of it. I was Satan then. And then she <laughs> she blocked me because I, you know, was obviously trying to convince her of demons were using me to convince her that the sun had some significant effect on our lives because she said only Jesus has an effect on her life and not the sun. It's really weird how so many, how people can go to those links too. It's just, it's really strange to me that it kind of reminds me like if, when we're when we're debating a, a liberal or a conservative or another libertarian or whatever, and you t- you're talking to a conservative and he's like calling you a liberal. Now, if you if you're saying that something that she's not comfortable with, she's calling you the demons are talking to you. It kind of reminds me of the same thing. And it's just really strange to me how people can can go to those links. I don't know. I don't. It's hard to explain. Like I just don't know how a mind a person's mind can get to that point. You know what I mean? It's just it's really strange. Do you know what borderline personality disorder is? Uh, I'm not, I, I know, I've heard of it. I'm not, I don't know enough about it to speak to it. It's a personality disorder, but it's key component. And, and a lot of people get misdiagnosed that are borderline because schizophrenia and a, a lot of things fall under this. But the key thing that distinguishes, I would say, there's like a few, but one, the one that really distinguishes the borderline personality disorder is called splitting. And that's where the things that they agree with are angels, saintly, good, you know, like ultimate good. 
and the things they disagree with are evil. Like, and and they do this with people that are either good or evil. They don't have any. There's no a human is a human, and so what ends up happening is it's almost like they cartoon fetishize people into these like angelic personalities like trump for example like we just saw the whole country go borderline about like trump and biden you know or trump and hillary it's like this person embodies and abuse everything that is the devil in this person and then when you show them something that makes like say trump human they'll go well he's not perfect only jesus is perfect and you know i said for years like this is like saying that jack black isn't a perfect replica of Beyonce, you know, like they both can sing high notes, but like they're not perfect. You know, it's like there's such a far cry from each other. Like Trump and perfection is so far away. Like if you look at like what he did and how he did the same pay to plays that Hillary did with Saudi Arabia and his daughter's foundation getting the money, you know, and all of these things that happen where they these are politicians that sell out the American public and the taxpayer. Not that I believe in any of that stuff either, but for their own personal end and own personal gain. And yet it's okay if he does it because he is what these people, like they have to have these like dualities happening. When Obama was in office, you know, we kind of saw it some with him, but not, I don't think it's on the same. And I talk about this quite a bit on the show, but, I don't think it's on the same level that we've seen with Trump, his supporters. You could point out all the blatant, disgusting things that Trump did while he was in office, and they just it doesn't register to them. Like, they just can't see it. It could be right there in black and white, and they're just not going to see it. Well, no, I think with Obama, it was the same, because I know people that still think Obama was like, this picture of grace and humanitarian and he was all about peace. And it's like, yeah, but what about all the war and the drones and the, you know, all of these different policies and they just, la, 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 I can't hear you, la, 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 you know, <laughs> they're like little kids with their fingers in their ear. Yeah. And it's <laughs> stomping around, holding their breath and stuff. It's just, I think that's really one of the part of the problems with this world is the, how people are so blinded to their, their their worship of these politicians. And these people are awful human beings. Let's just be real. You know, anybody seeking power over somebody has got some nefarious problems anyway. And I, I just don't trust them. I never will. I know what we've done with teenagers over through the public school system. Let's be honest. That's what created this. These were people that would normally have a job and be getting married by now and they're in high school and living with their parents and then they're going to college and still living with their parents or on, on their parents dime through their mid 20s you know but i think what's happened is there's never a point of growing up like their their parents handed them their adulthood by paying for their college but there was no like, OK, go get a job now at like 12 and 13 like we used to, you know. <laughs> and so now it's clear that we have extended this adolescence from, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. And then it's like, OK, and now that we've paid for everything for you up till now, you're going to get married and people are just going to give you gobs of money for presents for your wedding. And then you can put a down payment on a house. And it's like nobody's ever like earned anything anymore. No one's grown up. And there's this mentality among adults that I'm seeing in their older advancing years that makes them still sound really childish. It's just like. And that, and I think that's where this like borderline personality thing comes from, because it's kind of like when you're a little kid, you believe your parents are like perfect and to not believe your parents are perfect is terrifying because you have faith in them to protect you. But then when you're an adult, you start to realize, okay, they're human, just like me and everyone's human and we all can do good things and we can all do bad things and da 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 da, da you know we have just what they say infantilized all of these adults so like for so long they never come out of that like 
and their parents and their, I mean, we can go back to like what World War II, the space race and everything. And they're afraid to admit that those people might have been not telling them the whole truth about what happened in World War II or what happened on the way to the moon or whatever the deal is, you know, that, you know, that whole rah, rah, they were the best generation, yada, yada, you know, like we see a lot of those people won't be ill of the dead. I mean, there's so many like superstitious myths that we hold to keep our little worldview intact of everything being just the way that the, when I was a child, I grew up thinking, you know, the America and stand for the pledge and sit in the flag and don't put it on the ground. And all of these things, it, it kind of all goes together in this whole little, I mean, yeah, we've all been indoctrinated on each specific point, but more or less, it comes down to the fact that we don't want to like, say that our parents and our grandparents and our great grandparents might not have known everything. I mean, that's what it all boils down to. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think once the people's worldview starts turning upside down, when they start, I, I don't want to speak for you, but I know what happened to me because I was set in my ways as a, a neocon, you know, as a voting party, Republican party line, Republican, you know, and then my Trump got nominated and then it really just kind of turned my world upside down because I could not, get on with this guy. He was disgusting and how so many Christians were latching on to him. But once I started getting away from the Republican Party, my eyes started opening up to other stuff that was there this whole time. But I was blinded to it because I was scared of the Democrats, you know? And then once you, then when you, then you go down these rabbit holes, you start learning more stuff and more stuff. And you're like, man, if I'd have known this 20 years ago, I'd have been a whole different person than by now. Now I think I'm just grumpy all the time because I didn't learn this stuff earlier in my life. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I do. It's interesting. Like, so, so you were, you're that new. You're fairly new. Yeah. Well, I, my first time I voted was with George W. Bush. And the day after 9 11, I turned into a neocon and I voted for Republicans all the way till Trump. I got away from the Republican Party, seeked out a third party. And that was the last time I voted. I voted for Daryl Castle that year. And I started studying the Constitution. That led me down towards into the libertarian groups. I started talking to anarchists and libertarian groups. I thought they were nuts. But I moved to Memphis in 2018. And the more I studied anarchy, the more I saw it aligning with my faith. And then it's like a switch turned on for me. It was like, this is it. This is what I've been looking for. But... I didn't know there were a bunch of other Christian anarchists out there. I thought I was the only one. Like, I just discovered this all of a sudden. That, but, you know, the early church were a bunch of anarchists, and now I'm the only one standing. <laughs> Turns out there's a bunch of us out there, you know. So that was really that was really cool to find, to latch on with some of these folks. And, yeah, so I'm pretty new. You know the, you know the joke. Uh, the, the difference between libertarian and anarchists is six months. I and mean, it actually took me about two years. I mean, because I, I started thinking about this in 2000. 2018. So it took me 16 years. 16. Wow. It was around Bush. His his first term. I don't think I vote. I'm. I think I voted for him in the first term because I just didn't really know, and I was just a Republican going along with whatever. And then in the second term, I was like, I can't vote for this guy. Like I just don't buy any of this. And so the second term, I ended up just. I think it was like Bob Barr or somebody like that was running at the time. It was whoever was on the libertarian ticket. I just filled in, you know, third party because I just couldn't see it. And I wasn't really a third party person. I just wasn't the main two parties. And so I was pretty much like, I'm not the main two parties for, you know, until Trump. And right before Trump was elected, somebody I read Cybell Edmonds book. Um, somebody introduced me to that. And then after that, I was just like, wow, this is, and then I started following, um, on Syria or a Ava Bartlett talking about what was going on in Syria at the end of the Obama administration. I started to like clue into what was happening with Syria and how it was completely fabricated. And what most people believe about like Assad's army is just like, they don't realize like, why would Assad's army attack 
Assad's people because Assad's army is a voluntary military. Like a lot of people don't realize that the Syrian army is people from all over Syria have like our fight for their own country, similar to what Israel has. But um, those people wouldn't be attacking their own villages. You know what I mean? So it doesn't add up that they would be doing this. And so when you start to like, we call it Assad's army in the United States to keep people from realizing that those people are from those places where they're getting bombed and attacked. They're not going to do that to their own. And then to understand like all the factions and life in Syria before, you know, the intervention and how, how we radicalize not moderate rebels, but in fact, like extremist rebels, we funded money to and, you know, all of that kind of like kind of blowing up in my face was really and I already knew about the medical establishment and that that was like I knew that all along. You know, I followed Joe Mercola and those people and knew about the medical freedom and healthcare freedom and medical kidnapping. And so I was really aware of that stuff like long ago coming at catching up to now, right before the election a friend of mine shared a couple of videos of Larkin Rose. And that was that I was like, Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was like, okay, there all these pieces are lining up. And then it was like the tiny dot and offending activists. Cause I always think of, I'm, I'm, I wasn't really thinking of myself as an activist. Then I think of myself more as an activist now, but I'm not the activist that's looking to get the government to do what I want to oppress everybody else you know, based on my belief systems. And that that video just like, and I, sh my husband came home and I shared it with him and then boom, we were like done. We were just like, we had already pledged to vote for Jill Stein. So we went ahead and did it, but leaving the, the, the intellectual anarchist had already happened. And then the emotional one where you just don't go back was leaving the voting booth, even voting third party. and. I tell this story, but I'll often, so forgive me if you've heard it before, the, the, the old, this little old man at the school where we went and voted was like, can we put future voter stickers on your kids? And we were like, I was like, no, you know, like I was just, <laughs> I felt like I'm not going to allow my kids to participate in their own slavery. And the guy was like, okay. It was kind of like if somebody offers your kid, like something they're allergic to, and you're just like, you don't mean to overreact, but you do anyway, because you know, it's going to hurt them. <laughs> That's how I felt. And so I was just super like, and then Aaron's like, I don't feel so good. I feel like we just vote, voted knowing one participated in something, knowing one of two terrible people are going to end up like in leadership here. And I was like, I know. And we both were like nauseous, like, physically we didn't want our kids having the sticker we, we were just we were done we were like oh no <laughs> oh, what do we do you know it was walk of shame leaving it was total walk of shame like just like oh my gosh can everybody see what i just did ah so yeah that was that that was like the last election and that will be you know forever the last election for us i'll tell you i'll tell you what since I got, since I stopped voting, I, I have not missed it one bit. Like I used to get excited on election day, you know, I'd have get up, make me a big breakfast and I'd done all my research, especially for like the local elections and stuff. And now I just don't miss it, man. I could sleep through election day. Like it never, it never even happened. Like it's, I, I think taking a nap is way more productive than uh, voting. <laughs> so I'm, I'd rather just sit at home, take a nap or watch some TV, watch some, cartoons because it's all it's all a theater anyway hey folks greg here and i'd like to let y'all know we are always looking for writers to contribute to our blog i don't care if you have any experience or not two or three of our contributors had no prior experience writing and it turns out they have a real knack for it our project coordinator helps them put the articles together and she publishes them on our website and facebook page and you will also have the option to come on the show and go more in depth about your article. So if you like what we're doing at The Bad Roman and would like to try your hand at writing, then send us an email at thebadromanpodcast at gmail.com. 
We're having a blast with this project, and we would love for you to join us in helping promote it. Now back to the show. We've seen it so much, and I want to talk to you some about this too. We've seen it so much over this last year, the theatrics that have gone on with this COVID stuff. And it's still happening. I don't know. Y'all are in Utah, right? Yeah. Okay. So this is the middle of June, 2021 that we're recording this episode. And what is it looking like there in Utah? I know it's kind of, it's kind of coming out of it here, some around Memphis, but just in certain areas where I, where I live now, it's people, are, the masks are falling off. And so Salt Lake had um, their health, uh, their Salt Lake County's health authority stepped in and insisted that Salt Lake County continue to um, play along with the, with the farce. For us, I'm, I'm North, I'm in Davis County. So the whole state was April 10th was our day. And so April 10th, I went everywhere, you know? I mean, I've been going everywhere. I never wore a mask from day one. I never believed from day one. At, at first I thought there was no such thing as the coof and then or magic cooties or whatever you call it um i don't know where you broadcast this if it's allowed to say that that's what i I like and then my friend my dear friend jason who i've interviewed a bunch of times his dad actually got it right away really early on and he couldn't breathe at all and he went to the hospital and they sent him home and said you're not bad enough to put on a ventilator and basically come back when you are then his dad spent almost a month on a ventilator before dying because ventilators kill people. And then I was like, okay, so there is something out there. But because I hadn't been talking to Jason as much at that time, we used to talk like every single day and there was a whole bunch of stuff going on, obviously in the world, you know, and then it was after his dad was on the ventilator in the first few weeks that I started finding out about the benefits of various non-medical things like we always take allocampane to clear our lungs it's an herbal supplement and there's also a bunch of evidence that and i'm not saying to treat the coof specifically but that for clearing the lungs taking sski which is um, potassium iodide and taking a like large dose of that can clear out a lot of lung congestion and stuff and then, you know, high vitamin D, high vitamin C, high vitamin A is the things that you would always do for other types of like lung or respiratory things and stuff, elderberries, yada, yada. So there's all these things, you know, that we like use in our house and whatever. And I just really hadn't, Jason did, we did an interview together where he like actually talked about it after like a long time because he started Unmask Abilene after his dad passed away which is the anti-mask thing. And he, he mentioned that he felt so personally responsible knowing what he knew already as a medical freedom activist about the medical system that he let his dad fall into it. You know, he felt like responsible, like that he should have done everything he could, but you know, you can't tell your parents what to do. And if that's like where they were and, they were afraid of that or whatever, you know? So long story. I, I do believe that there is something. I do believe that the medical establishment has exploited it and hidden every possible treatment so they could get emergency use authorization for emergency use approval to start testing a vaccine that was known to kill animals on people in the majority of the trials and things like that. You know, like I know all about that kind of stuff. And I, yeah. Since it began, I was back in Arkansas visiting some family and friends on Memorial Weekend, and we kind of talked about it some. You know, there was one girl, she's like, she goes, you know, in the beginning, because I was terrified. I never, it never scared me. I've never been one to say that it didn't exist. I think something's out there. My dad caught it, and it was hard on him, but I can't wear a mask. It was, it's not an option for me because I'm severely claustrophobic. I can't wear a face shield because I'm severely claustrophobic. So I had to, if, if it was real, I had to try to figure out to kind of fight this if I needed to. But I've always taken vitamins. I've always, you know, boosted my immune system with vitamin C and zinc. My doctor put me on vitamin D because my vitamin D levels were low at the time. I changed my multivitamin around. Stuff started coming out. About, I don't know if you're familiar with Quercertin. You've probably, you probably heard of Quercertin. And 
I started reading up on that, and that actually helps you. I think it opens your white blood cells up to get the zinc inside your white blood cells to help fight this virus off. I never got sick, and I know I was around people that had it. It seemed like the majority of the people that I saw that were catching it or getting sick from it had a mask on their face almost all the time. And so I started trying to think, well, maybe these masks are making things worse. Maybe the masks are causing this, and people aren't thinking about that. Well, they included bacterial pneumonias and things like that in with the, you know, where a doctor could guess that it was COVID because they could diagnose you with COVID if you had these symptoms and bacterial pneumonia fit right under that. The flu fit right under it. So like there were a lot of people that got declared by their doctors without even a, and then they had the test so skewed, you know, it was three blind mice. They had three different tests. And they said that they all confirmed each other, but none of them really confirmed anything. And especially at where they were, the way they were running them at the beginning. Of course, they changed how they ran the the gold standard test right when the vaccine came out, so they could make it look like, oh, sudden case numbers and deaths are dropping because of, you know, it's like, well, if case numbers drop, deaths are going to drop because then the deaths are going to be attributed to something else, you know. If, If you make sure every person that comes into a hospital, most people die in hospitals. If you diagnose like most of the people that come into the hospital with a certain disease, then you can say everyone that died, died with COVID. You know, it's like, well, chances are if you're in the hospital, close you're going to get to death. So, (laughs) yeah, I, uh, I'll, I'll share a couple of stories with you. Um, My doctor, because when I, she, she was trying to push the vaccine you know, and, and stuff. And she said, she goes, we don't have uh, the flu cases have dropped because people have been wearing masks. And I said, so the masks are stopping the flu, but they're not stopping COVID. All right. The whole reason to wear a mask was for COVID. And uh, she said, she goes, well, yeah. And then she asked me if I was going to get a, get the, get a vaccine. And I said, no, when it was the end of the conversation, like she, I could kind of feel the tension in the room a little bit, but it was whatever. Then a, a coworker, he got pretty sick a couple of weeks ago and he thought he'd caught COVID and he went to the emergency room. They tested him. They said, you didn't test for anything. He says, man, I've got something. He said, my joints are hurting. He said, I'm, I'm sweating. I'm just, he, he was pr- pretty bad sick. He goes, I got the flu or something. You know what the doctor told him? He said, the flu doesn't exist anymore. And <laughs> he, said, he grabbed his stuff and jumped up and walked out. I said, come on, man. I can't believe these, there's doctors telling people this now. You know, and it, it's just dangerous to me to, 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 to act like that. Well, it got renamed just like polio did back in the day. <laughs> polio doesn't exist anymore either. Well, I've been saying that all along. We had, a, I don't know if you're familiar with Carrie Baldwin, but I had her on the show and I told her, I said, you know, you could see when this was starting, she wrote an article about uh, the virulence of moral panic. And it was right when all this stuff was coming out. And I told her, I said, you could see libertarians and anarchists trying to get out in front of this because you knew how the state was going to respond to it. But nobody was listening to us. We're all called crazy. And when she said this, she goes, well, every year this happens. All that, that bug going around is really nasty. That man, have you, have you been sick? That bug's been really bad this year. We say it all the time. But I've been saying this whole time. I said, We've still got the flu. We're just calling it something different now. And people look at you like you're a lunatic when you say stuff like that because they bought into all this garbage from the from what the government's saying and then doctors are it's weird because if you can you can find some doctors that are not buying into this you, but you've got to search for them on podcasts yeah well there's there's actually peter doshi at the bmj he's one of the editors of the british medical journal has been saying for years decades that the flu is even overhyped, like that people are getting like bacterial infections and all kinds of other things. And they're calling it influenza virus. But in fact, like they rarely test anybody for it or when they do, they just come off negative or whatever. And so every year they try to scare everybody everybody with a flu year or this, that and the other. And he's been showing. So surprise, surprise, when they actually test for the flu, they're not getting a lot of flu results. It's probably more like mold, stress, detox related illnesses and uh, bacterial infections and stuff like that, that we've all been dealing with around the season when we eat like candy, sugar and alcohol and cake 
and pie. Those are all my favorite things. <laughs> <laughs> From the end of September to January, it's one big party of gluttony, yeah. you know? And then we go, oh man, look at it. it's flu season and it's really <laughs> like detox season probably. I never even thought about that. That's that's a good point. And then you got the weather is dropped. So it's more stress. It's more stress on the body when the weather is bad too. So, you know, you've got that. So yeah, there are cases that test positive inf influenza, but I honestly don't think influenza was ever that bad. I don't think COVID was ever that bad. I think COVID was pretty rare. Like they were trying to say like everybody's caught it and everybody got a mild version of it. I don't even think that's necessarily the case. I think it was extremely rare to begin with. And very few people actually caught what like your dad or Jason's dad caught. That was really bad. That really put people in harm's way in a way and people seeing people in conditions they've never seen them before where they just can't get any oxygen that's something else but i think it died off really quickly it probably died off in the first few months and they just continued to run the tests fraudulently to keep us from knowing really and then and then throwing anyone with any symptoms on a ventilator and not giving them any treatments that have worked in the past for bacterial pneumonia and things that cleared the lungs that, that they gave people, you know, up at the dawn of time up until, you know, February, March of 2020, they had all an arsenal of things to give people to help them clear their lungs and do this. But they were told by government and hospital administrators and who made money because there was that whole, you know, cash for COVID subsidies program for hospitals so they were like don't give them anything that, that we've never done that to people before where we said don't give them anything you know just wait until they can go on a ventilator it was so crazy to watch how it just unfolded i've never seen anything like it in my life the, the, what worries me now like i think you're right i think it did die off yeah i think it did die off i don't i don't i don't think it was as bad as they were hyping it up to be i know it, people died i get it but it happens every year every single year it happens with the flu or whatever yeah what really worries me now what's the next thing because i was listening to your conversation with pete quinones to kind of prepare for this a little bit too and i'd already heard it but i messaged him to get the episode number because i wanted to hear it again like yesterday and you said i think he'd ask you because you said where where's the line what Where, where's the line at that we're, that we're willing to stop this at because i don't know if there is because what happens the next time because if it's another virus, what's going to happen? Because it's going to be far worse. Once they start stealing your, your your liberties and freedom away, you're not getting them back. And they're going to use something else to do even more damage. Yeah. So in Utah, outside of Salt Lake, it was April 10th was the day. But a lot, of, like say the main grocery store here is a is a subsidiary of Kroger and they give out vaccines. So even though they have never bothered us about not wearing a mask, but we were exceptional, it would be like us and maybe we'd see one other person in the grocery store at, at that day up until April, May, well, up until April 10th, at least there was no other people. And I was really disappointed to show up and see that they're still like, they still had the big sign, like. Please, you, you know, you're required to wear a mask inside our private business at Smith Kroger or whatever. So people in Utah are the most compliant people in the world. They are in the United States, I should say. They're the most compliant. They're not doing it because they believe in it. They're doing it because they're obeying the rules. And so we did not see a lot of rule breakers after April 10th. Not many. And then it wasn't until the whole Biden CDC came out with, if you're vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask anymore. And then I don't know if most of these people got the vaccine, which they may have, because again, Utah compliant people, you know, especially where I live is very LDS and they want to follow the rules and they want to do what their church tells them and the church told them to do it. So a lot of people went out and got vaccinated so they could travel or vaccinated so they could do this or that or the other or whatever. They're very compliant. They don't ever disobey the, the rule maker, whoever that is. So that was what we saw. Now, then as soon as they put the, if you've been vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask, but you're required to wear one still. So I'm still not wearing a mask. But now what I see, 
and I don't know how people don't see through this, that they changed the rules all, all along in Utah. It was like, if you were under six or seven years old, you were not required to wear a mask anywhere. And then now all of a sudden it's kids sh should wear masks because they can't get vaccinated yet. And so they changed it like the dangling the carrot, like the lady that had a Planned Parenthood or whoever it was that, um, You've seen the interview where she's with Cuomo and she's talking about how what's the carrot going to be. They they changed the rules at the last minute. And most people in Utah don't care if rules get changed. I mean, I hate to say it, but this, just, again, goes along with the compliance and the just not questioning things. And again, the religiosity of, of feeling afraid to question anything that a authority figure tells you. Or, you know, there's a fear, you know, that like you're going to go to hell or you're bad or you're just not a good person or whatever the deal is. There's a lot of that. So what I see now is a lot of adults walking around with no mask where their kids or little kids are wearing masks now and stuff. And so it's kind of like hard to watch. I, I almost everybody is not wearing a mask now in Utah and even in Kroger in where I live. And anywhere outside of Salt Lake County, you know, like it's just pretty much people are, unless they're, you can tell they have like green or purple hair <laughs> and they don't like look like they take care of their personal hygiene very well. <laughs> <laughs> am I, am I like naming a certain description of a certain political party that might be still wearing masks anyway, because they don't want to look like a Trump supporter. No. <laughs> Listening to you uh, describe, uh, what it looks like in Utah, it reminds, sounds a lot like Memphis to me. Now, Shelby County, which is part of Memphis, they were really strict with masks and stuff, and they were pushing vaccines. I bought a house out in Fayette County because I was trying to get away from that garbage, and it's just a different mindset out there. People are still wearing them, some, not as much anymore. Like, And I'm like, yeah, I don't know if these people got vaccinated or if they just finally bought into this or realized that this is all a bunch of garbage, you know? I don't know if they can be asked like work is they, I got an email from work and they were talking about if you vaccinate, you don't have to wear a mask. I've never worn one at work because I can't. And they know what I've, I've had a doctor's note since August, ex, you know, explaining this. And But I don't know if they can ask you if you've been vaccinated. Like, I don't think it's any of their business. Is it not that I want to get into any legalism, but is, is that not against the law or are they? I'm kind of ignorant on that topic. I got a friend that she's she's kind of dealing with this at work and at her job, and I don't know if it, if they can be asking folks this. Anybody can ask. The question is whether they can require you to answer. Does that make sense? Yes. I can ask you anything I want, but I cannot make it a requirement of your employment to answer necessarily. And so I think this is where people are going to have to like read between the lines because, yeah, it probably is illegal for them to re make it a requirement for you to answer or comply for your employment. However, there's like OSHA stuff has come out. I mean, I, do I know a lot about the law? Not a lot. What I think, and we're going to go back to that line in the sand thing, is whether or not people are going to say no in spite of their job or in spite of whatever, you know. And I, I don't think a lot of people have a line in the sand yet. Like, I think people like I had a lady telling me I was in I'm in this um, freedom group. And she was like, if you're not wearing a mask, you should be thanking me because I'm the one who like did a bunch of legal things so that you wouldn't have to wear one anymore. And I said, I'm not thanking you for anything. <laughs> First of all, I haven't worn a mask since the beginning. <laughs> Second of all. I, it, the law is not what I follow. You know, I don't follow the law of the land. I follow my own authority. Um, and I live peacefully with other people and I do what's rational and makes sense and is moral. Also, I don't think it's better now that we don't know who the morons are and we can't tell the difference between who our friends and allies are and who our enemies are because everybody's just doing what they're complying with now. and. Last, I'm still, I'm not going to go back and shop at any of the places I stopped shopping that wouldn't allow me in without a mask. I'm not going to shop at any of those places now that they've lifted their mask mandate because I do not want to give my business to those people. So 
thank you for nothing. You've literally done nothing for me through the legal system. And so again, I think this is where, yeah, maybe in a job you can bring up that, you know, OSHA used to have these recommendations, but OSHA has stepped back and said, we're not going to, at first OSHA made a thing and it was in their FAQs about whether or not they had to report people that had vaccine induced injuries. Um, if it was a requirement of employment, OSHA was saying it had to be written up as a job related injury, which means they'd be responsible. So I was like, oh, good. They're going to make somebody responsible. But then they realized right away that everyone jumped on it, this little loophole in the FAQs on the OSHA website. And so they said, we don't want to discourage anyone from requiring this as an employment any private businesses from encouraging their employees to get vaccinated as a requirement for employment. So we're not going to say that you have to report it anymore as that. Now, those people can end up taking their employers to court and winning, and that's going to be down the road a ways. But I mean, Pete has talked about this and I've talked about this. Um, and that is that OSHA writing that, they're not going to be the ones taking the fall for writing that. It's going to be the employers that will ultimately, because OSHA's not, can't provide them any guarantees that they're not going to get a civil suit against them for requiring something that damaged people's health or whatever. So, yeah, I, I it, it's probably going to come down the line that it will be something legal but for now, I think it's just a good conversation to have with people to start having with their employer. And and this is, again, goes back to, it's like when I went to a job interview, whenever I used to do that sort of thing, I would always negotiate and talk to them about getting higher pay, right? Coming in the gate and people are afraid to question employers and authorities. This is what they're offering and that's what I'm going to take and this, that, and the other. You know, I also, when I used to buy like, use CDs at a record store. I remember um, this is ages ago, they used to sell used CDs and new ones at like Blockbuster or these different record, you know, when people used to buy CDs back when the dinosaurs were around. Um, <laughs> they, um, I would go up and I was like, okay, they're all used. You guys are just making pure profit on these because people either donate them or sell them to you for like nothing. How about since I'm buying 15 or 20, you give me a deal. And my girlfriend, and usually I would walk in and they would make deals with me and the manager or an employee would just do it. And this girl that I was with one time freaked out on me and was like, the price is the price on things. And you don't negotiate with prices that people said. I'm like, why not? You know? And she screamed at me when we got in the car about how I embarrassed her. And that was the last time we hung out, obviously, because um, that was crazy behavior. <laughs> but people are afraid to ask for discounts. They're afraid to ask for raises. They're afraid to like rock the vote. And this is just our society's program this way. If people don't go have a confrontation with their employer and ask them to like look at the science or whatever, nothing will change. I agree. I completely agree. We have to have these conversations. Yeah. If we don't, it's just going to keep happening and people can't just keep resorting to the constitution or the government or the governor that's on their side, you know, right now, because we don't know. And like you said, in the future, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. I don't even try to guess what's going to like, probably if you asked me to really guess what was in the future, I would say a space alien invasion because that's like behold a pale horse kind of stuff, you know, like <laughs> what will they do to unite us all under a one world government, you know, af after the pandemic. And some people are like release a worse pandemic. And I think that's a little bit fear mongering. They seem to be doing really well with fake things. So not, not that COVID was fake, but that the pandemic was fake, you know, like real virus fake pandemic is where I stand on that position. I know a lot of people like it, but whatever. <laughs> Too bad. This is my opinion. <laughs> um, but they're doing really well with fake diversions and playing psychological games. And I think they love it. I think they love playing the psychological game and winning. 
Yeah. And I think they gave the mask thing. They, I think they, they ran the mask thing in its course, you know, like they knew that in Texas and Florida, they weren't going to be able to keep masks around for much longer because people would revolt. And I think that what they're doing is they're just playing with this line of the real line is the one they're playing with where they're anticipating where the line in the sand will be drawn. And they're giving in just at the edge of it to pretend like they're the one giving you the opportunity to do this. When in reality, if they kept up the tyranny five minutes longer, you would have been the reason why you're not wearing a mask anymore and not your governor, you know, like, and I think people need to reclaim this power within themselves. It reminds me of something. Are, are, are you familiar with that satire website, Babylon B? Yeah. Okay. So it reminds me of something they shared. It was, uh, it was talking about Governor Abbott in Texas. He said, Governor congratulates himself for lifting the mask mandate, but he was, or he was responsible for the mandate and he was congratulating himself. Basically, I think I agree with you. I think they stopped it because it was getting too close to not be able to take credit for something. So I don't think I ever really answered this on Pete's show, but clearly the line in the sand for most people is five minutes after their governor has already given in to them so that it looks like their governor is responsible or their local health officials have given in to them or the CDC has given in to you. The li- your line in the sand, they know exactly where it is. You don't. That's the difference. The difference is there's still stupid people out there that think their government gave them their freedom. There's still stupid people that think their rights come from government. And even when you point it out, they'll try to say, well, but it's because of the Constitution that we still have those rights, even though they don't come from the Constitution. Like you, there are <laughs> gymnastics around this. They don't want to let go of their their whoopee, you know, or their binky. <laughs> and they don't want to admit that like your gun. What you're, if they'd have held out five minutes later, it would have been your gun. And the reason why they gave in right now is because they knew it was going to be your gun. Because really what assures our, our rights are the willingness, our guns and our willingness to hide them and use them and keep them and not give them back. What you said reminds me of something. I, I, li- I lived in Arkansas for 25 years before moving to Tennessee and originally from Texas. But I was so I followed the governor on, on Facebook, the governor in, in Arkansas. And he lifted the mask mandate. And there was a comment in this thread. I was always giving this guy hell. But there was a comment in this thread. And he said, it's the government giving us our freedoms back. And I said, that is such a dangerous mentality to have. To even believe that the government provides you this, your freedoms. That is so dangerous to think that way. Once they know you believe that, they can do anything they want to you. And it's just, it's very dangerous. But we've gone for a little over an hour now. So I'm going to let you get out of here. Why don't you plug... Anything you want to plug? I know you got a website. And- oh, yeah. So I'm doing a lot of things right now. Um, I had been suffering from hot flashes again. I, a lot of women have been having an experience where their um, cycles are changing based on something in the air. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say about it. I don't know if it's vaccines or otherwise. I don't know if you've heard any of the rumors, but um I was going through perimenopause. My period stopped for a long time. And uh, like a couple of years ago, I did this protocol to help my hot flashes go down. And I did it for like two months and I didn't have hot flashes for 18 months. And then in December, all of a sudden my periods came back. I don't know what it was, but they came back for four months straight. And then as soon as they stopped, hot flashes came back. So I'm doing that protocol again. I made a private Facebook group and I made a calendar of what the protocol is because it's different doses of different natural home remedies that people have at home, like apple cider vinegar and baking soda, things that you'll definitely have in your kitchen cabinet. And so it's kind of complicated. So I made a calendar of the whole protocol that I've been doing and I'm selling it for $5 and and you can just private message me or whatever on Facebook, Karen Soverin. Or email me at the the Karen Keener at gmail.com. And I will, for $5, I'll send you a PDF and invite you into the accountability group on Facebook. Um, another thing I'm doing is I'm selling tooth powder right now. Um, if you live in the continental United States, I'll send you two for $20. And that includes shipping. They're 2.5 ounces packed with all kinds of stuff to heal, remineralize, and detoxify the mouth and the teeth and stuff like that. 
And I was working on Army of None. I'm going to get back on it. Sorry about the hiatus, because I know a lot of people were waiting. I'm interviewing different people that have served in the service, military service, and talking to them about the reality. And this is kind of an anti-recruitment video that I'm hoping will end up like my dream for it is to be at job fairs all over the country and have vets there sharing this video with parents of kids that are thinking of joining the military and having a table called Army of None where we give this free movie out to parents and kids to watch what real service members have to say about recruitment and their time in the service to potentially change their mind and save their life from making a hugely tragic decision. So if anybody would like to get in touch with me, I do have a few people that I need to like catch up with on that, but I want to get that project back on track. Um, now that my hot flashes are dying down (laughs) and I'm interviewing vets. So if any vets are watching your show or whatever, and would like to contact me and be a part of that project, helping kids make a different decision about military recruitment, I really could use as many interviews as possible to get that going. Yeah, I actually, I I remember hearing you talk to Pete about this and I love this idea, by the way. And the last is my website is thesovereignmom.com. And I do, I was doing Freedom Friday and Testimonial Tuesday. And again, with hot flashes and perimenopause coming back with weird symptoms. (laughs) I don't even want to get into. Um, But I talk about different types of home remedies and stuff like that. And just living a sovereign lifestyle, gardening, farming, agorism type stuff. And interviews with people that I think are really teachers or mentors for me and just having a conversation about anarchy in general so that it doesn't seem so scary and demystifies it. So that's what I do. I love your work, Karen. I really, really enjoy. uh, I followed you for some quite for quite some time on Facebook and you've been on top of a lot of things and you're doing a lot of good work out there. I really appreciate all the work you're putting in and and waking people up to the, the reality of our situation. Just keep keep doing what you're doing. And thanks for coming on. I really appreciate this conversation. Thanks for joining us this week on the Bad Roman Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the show wherever you find your podcasts to never miss an episode. And while you're at it, if you like what you heard, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, it really helps people find us. 100% of donations are given to local charities in Memphis, Tennessee. To learn more about The Bad Roman Project and to find show notes, please visit thebadroman.com.